All right, I think uh, I think we got this going. So today we're going to be talking about conservatorship again. My name is Amar, and this is Alex. How's it going, Alex? Hello. <laughs> so before we get started, let's just put our disclosures on, right? So remember, we're professionals. We're putting this on for educational purposes only. Um, so we haven't taken your account or any of your personal accounts into consideration. Uh, anything we need to add, Alex? Uh, so no legal or no attorney-client relationship has been entered into. It's uh, purely for educational and legal marketing purposes. Awesome. So I'm going to stop sharing this. And so conservatorship, what is it? So it's not fun. And the, the, the easy way that I like to explain it to clients is that a conservatorship is for adults who are incapacitated, who did not create a plan while they had capacity. So they don't have a trust in place or they don't have a financial power of attorney or an advanced healthcare directive. So there's nothing in writing. And because of that, when, if, when they become incapacitated, their loved ones have to scramble to be able to make decisions on their behalf. And yeah, so because of that, that means that court is involved. Yeah, it's a process, right? It's like you have to get, um, you know, I, I always envision maybe this is a wrong picture. And maybe you can correct me on this if it's totally out basis. But little old grandma in a wheelchair, like, has to be, like, put to the courthouse you have to wait in line outside, then you go into the courtroom, and then the judge has to make a decision. Is it, how does that process? Um... I mean, it's not too far from the truth. And so here's the thing. And I think that this is something that a lot of families don't realize, is that if you don't do your plan while you have capacity, then what that means that when you do become, or if you do become incapacitated, there will always be two attorneys involved. And so this is the important part to remember because it's basically your pocketbook that's paying for these two attorneys. And so the two attorneys are as follows. Your loved one who has to go to court to um, petition the judge to ask or petition the court to ask the judge to allow them to make decisions for you, whether they're financial decisions or healthcare decisions, they will need to retain an attorney to assist them, right? So they're having to pay that attorney to create the petition and go to the court hearing. However, when you're at the court hearing, the judge is gonna say, well, how about the person who's incapacitated? They're in the hospital or they're at home or they're in a nursing home and who's representing their uh, situation and their needs, right? And, and the common thought process is that the loved one says, well, I'm representing their needs, right? I'm, I'm acting in their best interest, but that's not how the court views it. The court views it as, you have your attorney and they're always going to be thinking that you're not you don't know what you're doing right and so they want someone else to come in to represent the person who's incapacitated and so that person's called a court appointed attorney and so the judge will appoint an attorney for the person who's incapacitated but the court doesn't pay for that attorney instead the person who's incapacitated is having to pay both of these attorneys right the loved one who's having to petition the court assuming that they get appointed their attorney is going to get paid for. And then likewise, the person who's incapacitated, their court appointed attorney, they're going to have to pay out of pocket for them as well. So you have two attorneys involved. It's really expensive. And that process lasts for as long as you're incapacitated. And have you um, have you ever had any of your clients who've had to go through this process or family? You know, I, I've only heard horror stories, right? Like it's like it's look, it's not a process you want your mom and dad to have to go through, right? So if you're listening to this video or watching this video, don't only think about yourself, but also your mom and dad and making sure your whole family have these documents in place is really important, right? And there's a lot of, like, I guess, expense involved, but beyond the expense, it's like all these headaches that you could easily just have, like, solved for while you were in control and while you had the ability um, exactly. Yeah, I know um, there was this one case, I think, that maybe we were talking about where somebody was trying to get a mortgage or something. Do you remember that one? It was like maybe yeah. a couple of years back or something. Right. So yeah. I, you know, so 
just to let everyone know, I don't do conservatorship. I don't take those cases on only because I don't enjoy them. I think they're a complete headache. And if you can avoid them, I'd rather try to do all the pre-planning. But when I was a baby attorney, and this was about uh, 16 years ago, so it was a while ago, I was <laughs> taking conservatorship cases because I didn't know any better. I was like, great, I'm going to take these cases on. And so one of the first cases that I had for a conservatorship a, well, it wasn't a full-blown conservatorship case. It was a, we were trying to petition to do a specific action. And in this situation, it was a husband and wife, and they had been married. It was their first and only marriage. They had been married for over 20, 30 years. They had a, a few children together, and they had a home together. And husband was incapacitated. He had dementia. And at that time, so this was, uh, well, this was even back uh well, however long ago, it was about 15 years ago, let's say, um, their interest rate was really high. And so mom or um, wife, she wanted to 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 petition the court to ask for permission to refi. She wasn't asking to take money out. She just wanted to refi the, the loan. And for whatever reason, the attorney who was representing husband, he didn't he didn't think it was a good idea for whatever reason, something about the situation didn't sit well with him. And so in his report to the judge, he said, judge, I, I don't think that this is in the best interest. I don't see why they need to do this. And the judge sided with the the attorney for the husband, for the uh, with the court appointed attorney. And so the petition was denied. And I felt so terrible for this family because all that the mom or the, the wife was trying to do was to try to lower her payment so that she could continue to like support and provide for the entire family, including husband. Yeah, uh, I mean, so it's just was... crazy to think, right? Like you're giving up control to a third party that doesn't even know the family dynamics, the situation. Uh, and you're giving that control away from your spouse in, in that specific uh, example. Exactly. Yeah, so I, word I, of the wise, just... don't wait till you're incapacitated because if you wait till that time, it's too late. That's stuff that you need to start doing now. And it's such an easy fix. Powers of attorney, uh, healthcare and financial. Uh, if you had that in place or if they had that in place, they wouldn't have been in this mess to begin with. So yeah. easy fix. Yeah, so I guess maybe in summary, the solution is... And you want to just say it again so that way it's like perfectly clear, right? Yeah. So the the call to action for anyone who might be listening to this video is don't wait until you're incapacitated to start thinking about the type of plan you should have. Instead, you should have a complete estate plan in place. And ideally, that would include a trust, a pour over will, a financial power of attorney, an advanced health care directive. But specifically with what we're talking about in in this video having a financial power of attorney and an advanced healthcare directive would have avoided so many issues and problems. Yeah. So, And this is while you're still alive, right? These are issues that will happen while you're still alive. So exactly. Um, I think, I think it's a good takeaway from this video is just to get started. Um, you don't have to have it perfect on day one. I know, uh, I don't know if my mom is like this. I don't know about you, Alex, but it's like analysis paralysis. So like she'll want to know who's first in line, second in line, third in line, and won't do anything until she knows that order or, or, you know, that's just an example. But like with this type of stuff, you don't have to be perfect the first time around, right? It's just having those documents with people you trust is like the first step. And then you exactly. can always refine this over time. Oh, precisely. And I always tell clients that because yes, I, I do have quite a few clients who do get that analysis paralysis where they start the process, but then it's not the exact 100% they're not sure if that's what they're always going to want and that's not really the the question the question is is that okay for right now and what i always tell clients is go home and sleep on it and if it keeps you up at night with the decisions you made well then okay then maybe that wasn't the best decision but if you don't think about it again and you're not like constantly thinking mulling it over then you know what chances are that was a good decision that you made and it's better to have something in place versus nothing it's something is better than perfection right we just want yeah. to protect you yeah i think that's a good point to end on right something is better than perfection so thank you for watching if you have any questions for alex or myself please reach out to us if you have any ideas for videos that alex and i could be talking about or questions that you have that relates to estate planning family dynamics uh just just overall planning um uh, please let us know in the comments thank you Bye. Bye.